missing quite a few tonight too. I think it would be good if we all together said the books of the Bible. That means we ought to be hearing some bass voices speaking tonight. All right? One, two, three. Genesis. Deuteronomy. Joshua. Judges.
We listen to the Word of God. Word of God. Word of God. We listen to the Word of God. And it increases a good quick. The Lord, that's right. We take the Lord's Supper. Lord's Supper. Lord's Supper. We take the Lord's Supper. Remember in His death. That's it. There's only five. That's right. There's only five. <laughs> All right, God said that it is over. It's no longer a moment for a teammate. They have been just a crowd that battles. That is excellent. Now, we're going to do the plan of salvation, but we're going to do the name, I mean the verse, and we'll sing the verse if we do it, okay? All right. I say, hear, you say. Faith comes by hearing, faith comes by hearing, faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. Believe. If you do not believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Repent. 13 3. I tell you no, unless you repent, you shall perish. Confess. Acts 8 37. And Philip said, If you believe, Philip said, If you believe, Philip said, If you believe, with all your heart you may, the unit gets her, yes, I believe, the unit gets her, yes, I believe, the unit gets her, yes, I believe, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and then be baptized. Acts 2 38. Acts 2 38. Acts 2 38. And Peter said to them, to them, to them, Peter said to them, repent and be baptized. Be baptized in the name of the name of the name of, be baptized in the name of the name of Jesus Christ. For the remission, 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 for the remission, remission of sins. And you'll receive, 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 and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then live faithful. Revelation 2.10. Revelation what? 2.10. Here, I didn't hear it. Revelation what? 2.10. Be faithful, be faithful, be faithful unto death. And I, and I will give you a crown of life. Do not get anything that I'm not afraid. All right, how many of do we have here? Four. Four. I know one of y'all observed that only three were up here today. I said, we've got so They said, we've got four of them. One's missing today, right? Okay. So we got four of them. Two of them. Google has four elders.
might be who builds all things is God. Back to what you said a minute ago, what's the verse we can see that emphasizes we need to trust God in everything? Proverbs what? Good. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your steps. Okay. Now somebody wanted to sing fuzzy, and I think we got time for that. Right? Fuzzy was a caterpillar. He wiggled up a tree. He wiggled long. He wiggled short. He wiggled right at me. I put him in a little box. Don't go away, I said. But when I opened up that box, it's a butterfly. I said, no, I could never make one. Not even if I tried. Only God, our heavenly Father, can make a butterfly. Squiggly was a tadpole. He wiggled in the lake. He wiggles long, he wiggles short, he wiggles like a snake. I put him in a little jar, don't go away, I say. But when I opened up that jar, oh, I could never make one, not even if I tried. Hop and frog was made by God just like that butterfly. Are y'all scared? Tell me what true success in life is. Immediate success is set together. Okay? What is true success in life? Living your life and going to heaven and living your life like Then what's true failure in life? Living your life and going to heaven and living your life like a What's God's ideal for marriage? One man and one woman in your life. Excellent. And uh, why did God make you? Why were you made? that me. No, we don't tonight. All right. We are so happy that everybody is here tonight. We're glad that uh, you've taken the time to be here for our Bible classes. We also uh, want to welcome those who may be visiting with us uh, here at Boonville. It's an honor to have you, and I hope you'll uh, give us a chance to express that to you before you leave. I'm not going to make any announcements before we dismiss the class other than remind those that may need to take of the Lord's Supper. Uh, if you will go to the little chapel uh, on the way to class, uh, you'll be served at that, at that time. Also, uh, remember our ice cream social tonight that is honoring our four high school seniors. And so I hope you'll plan to stay and honor them uh, as a part of that tonight. So before we dismiss the class, uh, let's have a closing prayer. And ask Brother Adam to lead it. Let's bow. Our Heavenly Father, we once more come and we approach you. We thank you for another great day that you have given us here. We thank you for this great honor and this great privilege we've had of coming to worship you this day. And we ask you to be with us as we prepare to enter into another study of your word. And may we take the things that we're going to hear and be ready to accept them and may we use them in some way to be able to apply them in our lives and likewise perhaps be able to help others as we have the opportunity. We thank you for each and every one that is here and present this evening. We ask you to watch over all those that are not here, whatever their circumstances might be, and if it be your will that they return to us 
in the very near future. We ask you to watch over, be with all of those of our number that are struggling with health in various ways, and we ask you to be with their caregivers and any and all who are administering care in any capacity, and if it be your will, that they too return to strength and health, but we especially ask you to be with any and all who may be struggling spiritually for whatever reason that might be, and that they will look into you and be strengthened, and may we be able to help and to encourage them in some way as well. And it is for these things that we ask, and in Christ's name, amen. You're welcome. Good to see you. Hope you had a wonderful day today. Earlier, about an hour ago, I got like a fur ball in my throat. I couldn't even hardly talk, just catching and making me cough. And so I had a little water. We sang it out at the nursing home. But if I catch another fur ball, then just bear with me, okay? Just nod your head this way. And also, I'm going to tell you this. Now, we're going to have a lot of Bible reading tonight, so stay with me there. I hope you have your Bible. You can open it to the book of Judges. We'll be looking at three chapters tonight, three, four, and five. But next week, next week, we are going to slowly become more technologically advanced. Hey, are you excited? So last week we had nothing. This week we're going to have PowerPoint slides. And next week, we may have screen mirroring. Ah! So we'll just see how that goes. We were going to try it tonight, but Jeremy said there were some things left to do. So I said, whoa, I don't want to be the guinea pig necessarily. So let's just wait one more week. So that's what we're going to do. I want to share with you the people that I have who are sick. that We'll be praying about in a moment. And if you have somebody you'd like to add, we'll do that. Irene Baker and John Dryden have terminal cancer. Uh, Martha Eaton, we pray for her that she'll be able to get her foot straightened out. Austin Wentz is undergoing treatments, but is up and down. Terry Green is undergoing chemo treatments at UAB. Verlin Davis has Alzheimer's. Ann Stevens has health problems. Jeff Goff injured his back several weeks ago. He's recovering. Connie Edge is recovering from knee surgery. Marilyn Wilson had emergency back surgery. She's recovering. Uh, Todd English's mother, (coughs) Edith, had surgery in Memphis, but she's in rehab. Um, My mother-in-law is undergoing testing. Kim Fowler broke her right foot. Don Dawson's been having stomach issues and some other (laughs) other problems. That that fur ball's coming back. Kara Burns and her daughter, uh, recovering from automobile accident. Johnny Howe has cancer. That's Ken Scott's aunt. Roger Mooney's wife, Connie, had hip replacement surgery in Tupelo. She's recovering, but it's going slowly. And basically, they're trying to help her learn how to walk again. So we're hoping they'll be successful with that. 
Uh, Shirley Stacy, who is Rick Warner's friend, uh, actually his mother's friend, she passed away. <coughs> Sue James has cancer. That's a friend of Rick Warner's. Randall Mooney had been in the hospital. He's been released, and we're glad for that. Gary Thornton's undergoing cancer treatment. That is Barbara Gwynn's brother. Anita has a student whose father has tumors requiring some surgery. Sean Hummers, Humbers. Uh, Brian Faulkner, 17, has been in the hospital. Not real sure what the problem is. Anybody have an update? <coughs> Still don't know what the problem was, but out of the hospital? Okay. All right. Well, we'll still we'll still remember Brian. And <coughs> sorry, Quitman Wigginton is in in the hospital in Oxford. He fell again. It resulted in a brain bleed. It apparently is an old one that has reoccurred, and they're seeing a specialist. Hopeful they can take care of that with a new procedure. Okay. I'm up to date on my list. I, I've got water here. Thank you so much, Chris. Appreciate everybody throwing the water at me today. And Chris, thank you for that. Got some, uh, though. It's not that kind of problem. It, it's a hairball. I'm just telling you. <coughs> yes, sir. I got one in my mouth. It's not a. It's not that kind of. Th if, it, if I could just jump, you know, pull it out, it would. <coughs> yeah, like with a pencil. Get it like that. Okay, let's, we're going to pray about these. Let's sing a song first. How dare me, right? But we're going to. Uh, number 886. We'll just sing the first verse. Yes. Uh, understand that he's doing much better. She returned home. <laughs> she returned home. So uh, we're thankful for that. Yeah, Jody's back. <coughs> understand that her dad is much better. So we're, we're thankful. 886. We'll just sing the first verse. After that, we'll have our prayer and then begin our study. On joy and storm, he thinks I stand and pass so just a few minutes. Let's have our prayer and then we'll begin our study. <clears throat> our Father in heaven, we're thankful to you for the blessing of this day. And we're thankful for our health and strength and the freedom to be assembled together to worship and now to study from your word. And we pray that these endeavors we'd never take for granted and that we'll be benefited from it. We pray, Lord, for those who are sick and we're praying for their recovery at your will or we certainly pray for their comfort and their conditions. Please bless Melinda Hester's mother, Irene Baker, and Laura Galloway's dad, John Dryden, as they're dealing with cancer. We pray for Martha Eaton and her recovery. Bless Austin Wentz as he's undergoing treatments, and Terry Green as he's in the midst of his. We pray for Verlin Davis, who's under the throes of Alzheimer's, and we pray for caregivers. We ask your blessings on Ann Stevens, Jeff Goff, Connie Edge, Marilyn Wilson, Edith English, as they're all trying to recover from health issues. Bless Ruth Staley as she's undergoing tests. We pray good results. Pray for Kim Fowler and her recovery with a broken foot and Don Dawson, who's been so very sick. We ask your blessings on Kara Burns and her daughter and their recovery from the automobile accident. Bless Johnny Howe as she has cancer. We pray for Connie Mooney and her hip replacement. We pray that she'll be able to regain her mobility and do well, have a full recovery. We pray for Shirley Stacy's family and for their comfort. We pray for Sue James, who has cancer. Please bless Randall Mooney that he'll have good days and get the rest and comfort that he needs. We pray for Gary Thornton, who's undergoing cancer treatment. 
We ask your blessings on Anita's student's father who has a tumor requiring surgery. We pray for Brian Faulkner. We pray that he's doing much better. And Lord, we pray for Quitman. Uh, we just we just pray to be free from falling and injury. And we're asking, Lord, if it's your will that uh, what is necessary to help promote healing, healing with him, that it'll be within the grasp of his doctors to treat him in such a way that this won't reoccur. We just pray protection for him that he'll not fall anymore. Please bless us in our study together as we're looking at your word as a group. And I pray, Lord, that our benefit will come from exposing some beautiful truths that we find there. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so the judges are what kind of people? I mean, generally speaking, what kind of people are they? Warriors, uh, leaders, uh, warrior leaders. You put your little hyphen in there because in every single case, you've got somebody who's going to battle. And almost always, they go to battle, they restore balance and goodness and refocus the people on God, and then, well, they become the civil leaders. And you'll see them reigning, or at least leading, for 40, 80 years in some cases. So... That's, that's the gist of what the judge does. If you've got the picture of somebody who wears, you know, the, the black robes or in Europe with the wigs and so forth, that, that's not our guy, or in our case tonight, our girl. This is a leader, and someone specifically called by God himself. We're also going to see in a text tonight that in addition to the judge designation, there's a new word that'll come into it, and that is deliverer, someone whose responsibility and work it was to deliver the people out of the state of their oppression. Now, I told you that I have a co-teacher, and that's uh, Chris. Chris actually, Chris uh, Langley, Chris actually kind of laid this thing out for us, and I really appreciate him doing that, and he's got it into some sections that I think we can digest quickly. And we're looking in terms of an overview at something like this. It's gonna get worse before it gets better. And then it's gonna be great. So the part where we're going downhill is this book, <laughs> Judges. It goes downhill and then it falls off the cliff at the end. But the book of Ruth, kind of a reflection of how things went in other parts of the world uh, is Israel's interest. Things are, things are good. And we see how God preserves his plan for his people. Ultimately, through Ruth will come our Savior himself. Okay, so tonight we're actually going to look at several judges. Now, the key names are Othniel, who's the first judge, Othniel, Ehud, and Deborah. Deborah's going to take up two chapters. The action takes place in chapter 4, and then there is a song that was written about the exploits in chapter 5. We're going to concern ourselves primarily tonight with chapters 3 and 4. And in that, we're going to see Othniel. We'll find him in verses 7 through 11. Then verses 12 to 30, we'll see Ehud. Then there is one verse devoted to a guy by the, um, by the name of Shamgar. And I'll share some things about him. And then we have Deborah and then Barak associated with her. Okay, that's how we're going to do it. Now, we're on the express track, okay? That's, that's five of 15 already. Okay, so this is the setup, the first four verses of chapter 3. Now, these are the nations which the Lord left. And every time you see, and by the way, every time you see L-O-R-D in all caps like that, actually, that is the editor's way of showing you that the original language had the name of God right there, Yahweh, Y-H-W-H, -H, in, in the English transliteration of the Hebrew, <laughs> Yahweh. So every time you see the capitalized Lord, or sometimes it's actually capitalized G-O-D, when you see that, you know he's not just talking about God generally speaking, he's talking about Yahweh, the God of Israel, okay, his personal name. 
So these are the nations which the Lord left that he might test Israel by them. So the nations are left in the land that was supposed to be taken as a possession, right? The promised land. However, they had failed to run them out. So the Lord says, okay, you know what? That's fine. I'm not running them out. Remember what the angel of the Lord did last time? I'm not going to touch them. So I'm going to leave them. But why am I leaving them? I'm going to test you. I'm going to, going to put you under them. That is, all who had not known any of the words in Canaan. This was only so that the generation of the children of Israel might be taught to know war, at least those who had not formally known it. Namely, five lords of the Philistines, all the Canaanites, the Sidonians, and the Hivites who dwell in Mount Lebanon from Mount Baal, Hermon, to the entrance of Hamath. Why these nations as opposed to some of the nations we've already beat up real good? Well, I kind of think it's because of that reason. These people don't know the wrath of God yet, right? And so it's like they're fresh candidates. They don't have the fear of the Lord in them. So God says, you know what? I can use them because they'll be, how do we put it? They'll be unsuspecting, right? Many of these other nations I have laid the wood to. But now these guys, they'll be unsuspecting. So I'll use them. And they were left that he might test Israel by them to know whether they would obey the commandments of the Lord, which he had commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. So we have another what? Starts with a T, ends with a T, and has an E-S in it. Another test to the people. Do you trust me or not? Will you obey me? Will you follow my commandments? We want to say, yes, we will. Yes, we will. But it was always conditional, right? So long as things were going great, were they obeying the commandments of the Lord? Eh, not so much. Started trusting in whom? Themselves. We are great. But we're going to find out through these, <laughs> through these unsuspecting nations that such is not the case. Thus the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hittites, and the Jebusites, the Termites. Did you get that? Okay, write that in there. No, no termites. Uh, they took their daughters to be their wives, gave their daughters to their sons, and they served their gods. What did God say? The one thing you absolutely will not do when you go into that land of promise is... <laughs> you will not do what you just read right there. Take the daughters and the sons and serve the other gods. The one thing that God said, when you go in there, don't intermingle with these people, because if you do that last thing will happen. What did they say? We won't. We will do it. We will always serve the Lord. Oh, we're with you. But now we are one generation removed. Chapter 2, verse 10 told us what? That one generation, did that make a difference? There was one generation who rose up who did not know God, nor the works that He had done for Israel. And here is the result. And so we need a man by the name of Othniel. Oh, I love it. Now let's think about Othniel for a minute. You know that in the Bible, names mean something. They're significant. This name right here has significance to it. Othni, which is the first part of this name, actually means force. And then El, anybody know what E-L typically means? You do. You've heard it a million times. God. El is typically the general name for God. Okay, so let's put that together. What do we have? Force God. Now, in English, when I have it lined up that way, I would probably have said his name is defined a force of God. Boy, it sounds like a great name for a judge. However, you remember what I told you about these Hebrews. They do everything backwards, right? So instead of force of God, it's actually God hyphen force. You say, that, that doesn't really make much sense. Is he to be a God force? No, actually, if you were to look up the name, it, most people take that to mean he was named God of protection or God the protector. Okay, so... Again, now I'm looking at him from a different light, and I'm saying, all right, well, I fit him into a story as the first judge, as a military leader of the people of God. 
who's going to be a deliverer of them. And hey, I get it. He reflects the very nature of God's desire to protect us. Now, Othniel is also interesting because, now you've already read this. You read the first two chapters. In chapter 1, we kind of have a rehashing of things that happened before. And Othniel is in the story. In fact, Othniel finds himself one of the beneficiaries of his relationship with Caleb. So the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. They fought the Lord their God and served the Baals and Asherahs. Baals were the male deities. The Asherahs were the female deities. Okay, so Caleb had a younger brother. Caleb's younger brother was actually the father of Othniel. Now what happens, you'll you find that designation in the first chapter I mentioned, verse 13, kind of the, the family connection. So Joshua had gone into the land of Canaan and, you know, they were kind of rolling, taking over these cities. In Joshua chapter 10, verses 38 and 39, they came to this city called Debir, D-E-B-I-R. Joshua conquered that city and now he's rolling on. Somehow or other, Debir was lost. And when Caleb came to that city, he said, you know what, we've got to retake the city. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to offer my daughter, Aksa, to the man who will step up and lead the military conquest of the city of Debir. Who is going to take me up on it? And it was this guy, Othniel, who said, I will do it. Othniel went into Debir, and guess what he did? He conquered it. He had great success. He ends up with Aksa, and she is, she's kind of spunky. And so she has inherited this land, but it doesn't have proper water flowing to it. Remember this story? And so she goes to Caleb, her father, and she says, you know what, we also need the upper and the lower springs in order to provide. She's kind of a reflection, you know, an early reflection of Proverbs 31, right? The ideal woman or the ideal wife, one who's willing to take matters into her own hands. That's who this is right here, this judge. The guy who's got all this background, well-connected, a part of the, the elite pedigree of Israel. That's this guy. So he leads them, uh, he's going to lead the people against this insurrection by, by the people as they followed after these gods, both the male and the female gods. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. Before we go any further, I want you to do this. You remember the pattern that we described last time about how things went? We start with the Lord and then it goes downhill. Watch and see if you don't, if you don't recognize that pattern described in these few verses. So the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. Why? Because they began to serve the Baals and the Asherahs. And he sold them into the hand of Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia. Stop right there. What's happened so far? Okay, so they were with God, but then what did they do? They become unfaithful. They left Him. Then what did God do? He got angry. He got mad. What did He do then? He empowered that foreign nation, right? And they began to oppress the people. The children of Israel served Kishan Rishathaim eight years when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, Oh, help us, help us! Remember the contrition part of it? Where, oh, we're so sorry now. Why are we sorry? Because we've been suffering for eight years. So help us. Oh, Lord, we're so sorry. So they, they cry out to the Lord. The Lord raised up a deliverer. And this is what I want you to, want you to notice. And you're going to see this several times through the book of Judges. He is a deliverer. We raised up a deliverer for the children of Israel who delivered them. Was he successful? Raised up a deliverer to deliver. And he what? That's past tense. He delivered them. Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. The Spirit of the Lord, that's another thing I want you to kind of put on a hook. You're going to see the Spirit of the Lord acting through the book of Judges too. Most notably, you'll see it in the story with Jephthah 
and you'll see it in the story with Samson. And what's great about those two occasions is when the Spirit of the Lord comes on the scene, you know what happens to those guys? They go into berserker mode. They just go wild. So God is serious about the action that He wants His deliverers to take. There is not going to be any question mark as to whether God's going to be successful through this judge, right? Just go ahead and accept that fact. When God empowers that person, He is going to win against these unsuspecting, these unsuspecting nations. Okay, so the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. He judged Israel. He went out to war. The Lord delivered Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand, and he's prevailed over Cushan Rishathaim. So the land had rest for 40 years. Then Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. It's like, boom! And then once it was over, what happened to the faith of the people? It's restored, right? And then for 40 years, what are we able to do? Have peace, go on, everything's cool. You see already, but before we get any further, you see kind of a theme here. When Moses was the leader and he demonstrated that God was with him, how did things go? They listened to Moses. When Joshua then became the leader and things went according to plan, when they were faithful, as long as Joshua lived, and even after Joshua died, those who had been elders with Joshua, how did things go? Beautiful. But when those guys died off, what happened to Israel? They jumped off a cliff, it seems like. Here we have Othniel. Othniel has restored favor with God. We have demonstrated God's faithfulness. Oh man, we are good. Except that the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So what do you think God did? <laughs> the Lord strengthened Eglon, king of Moab, against Israel because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. You see what God's doing now? What's he raising up with Eglon? Another enemy, right? Is this enemy going to defeat God? Check your head this way. No, but he will be used to defeat what group of people? The Israelites who are, starts with an, in, an un, who are unfaithful to him, right? They, they have lost their way again. They become self-dependent once again. They've taken their eyes and their hearts away from God. So God's going to raise up this Eglon. So Eglon, king of Moab, he's against Israel because they've done evil. Then he gathered to himself the people of Ammon and Amalek, went and defeated Israel, took possession of the city of Palms. So the children of Israel served Eglon, king of Moab, 18 years. Let's make a prediction. You think it's okay? Everybody's fine. That's fine. We'll just serve Eglon. We love serving Eglon. Yes? No? No? When the children of Israel, you love a whiner, they cried out to the Lord. So what did the Lord do? He raised up a deliverer for them. Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjamite, a left-handed man. Okay, so I'm just going to assume the best and think you've already read through the book of Judges. When you got to chapter 20 at verse 16, you were introduced to another group of Benjamites. In that text, we find a group of Benjamites. In fact, the group is made up of 700 Benjamites. And every single one of them is, guess what? <clears throat> Left-handed. In fact, in that text, it tells us that they had a skill. They could use a sling and hit their target so efficiently that it was within a hair's breadth of the mark they were aiming for. A hair's breadth. How, how wide is that? Wouldn't you just call it a bullseye? You know, it's just a fancy way of saying those guys were amazingly accurate. What's the deal with the left-handedness? I'm just asking. No, no, don't really know if anybody had an idea. It does seem to be a particular DNA trait with the Benjamites, given that there is a large group of them that seem to be able to do it. 
Another thing is, since you're a typically expecting that somebody's going to fight you with their right hand, then when they come off with the left, what? Whoa, surprise, didn't see that coming. I'm going to tell you before we get much further that not seeing this one coming is going to result in a significant death. So Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjamite, left-handed, by him the children of Israel sent tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. So what's, what's Ehud's job? He carries the money that we send so that Eglon don't come and, you know, squash us. We're, we're paying him off. And we have to pay him off on a regular basis. And Ehud, along, we'll see, along with another troop of men, are responsible for carrying that money and paying off Eglon, paying the tribute to them. So Ehud made himself a dagger. It was double-edged, a cubit in length. How long is a cubit? Typically considered from the elbow to the tip of your fingers, but we all almost always say it was about 18 inches. There's also a half so that would have been nine inches. But what's interesting about this is we describe this knife, this double-edged dagger, as being a cubit in length. I think for a specific reason, because th there's an interesting thing about Eglon. He fastened it under his clothes on his right thigh. So he's left-handed, right? It's on the left thigh. So he's going to probably, I'm going to think that the handle is, is here so he can grab that thing and wield it. Don't want to give anything away. I'm just saying there's a reason for putting it this way. So he puts it under his clothes on his right thigh. So he brought the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now, Eglon was a very fat man. That's in the Bible right there. Forever and ever, Eglon and his physical condition will be known to all. And you know what I'm thinking? When the Bible calls you a fat man, what do you suspect he was? I'm suspecting he was grossly fat, so fat that the Bible's like, let me tell you something about this Eglon. That guy was huge. That makes sense because we're carrying not, not when the, when you think of a dagger, you think of something that's pretty short, you can hide. He's got an, he's got an 18 inch dagger hiding under his clothes. Why would you need an 18 inch dagger, you think? I'm I'm thinking this a pretty long way to the guy's heart, if that's what you're shooting for, right? Just thinking out loud here. Okay, so when he had finished presenting the tribute, he, he does his job. He sent it with the people who had carried the tribute. So, like I said, he, he went with the group. But he himself turned back from the stone images that were at Gilgal. Wait, stop right there. Do you remember that incident? When we crossed over as a people, when we crossed over the Jordan River, what was one of the first things that we did? We put the 12 stones up in the city of Gilgal. What was the purpose of putting those stones up? When you see it, you'll be reminded or told by somebody who knows it exactly what happened on this spot. God delivered us by allowing us to cross over the Jordan River. So what is that telling? Where was that in proximity to the Jordan River? Basic, first city in, right? Just basically right out of the water. So, get this image. Ehud is escorting his people how far? To safety. I know what I'm about to do to Eglon. It's not going to be good. And so, I'm going to need to travel fast. I'm going to travel alone. But I want to make sure that you guys are safe. So, he basically carried them all the way back to where? To the Jordan River, yes? Yes. Just nod your head this way. You guys wake. Yes, we are, kid. Okay, so he's going to see to them. So he, he sent the people away. He would carry the tribute. He himself turned back. When he got there, he came back. And he said, I have a secret message for you, O king. Now, when somebody tells you they got a secret for you, what do you want to do? Ah, uh, you know what? I don't, I don't really care about that. Secrets? Nah, forget it. No, what is he? He's like, yeah. Yeah, I want to hear about that. So he said, oh, keep silent. Don't say anything. So what does he do? Clears the room. Send everybody out. It's a secret message. Don't want anybody in here. So Ehud came to him, right? Now he's sitting upstairs in the cool private chamber. So he's just kind of making his way to the king. 
Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. Oh, man. So he arose from his seat. Then Ehud reached reached with his left hand, took the dagger from his right thigh, and thrust it into his belly. Even the hilt went in after the blade. Tell me what we just read. Okay, so the knife typically had like a, a, a guard on it, the hilt. He submerged that knife how deep into this king? All, all, all the way. The whole thing. It, it, it isn't anything left that he has shoved into his belly. Even the hilt went in after the blade. The fat closed over the blade. For he didn't draw the dagger out of his belly. And his entrails came out. You think the Bible doesn't gross us out sometimes? I mean, seriously. Now, warning, warning. Chris, is this right? We get to the end of this book. This is like the comic book section. It gets really gross in this book. But this is, this is the reality of it. This was the seriousness of the matter. Ehud went out through the porch and shut the doors of the upper room behind him and locked them. When he had gone, Eglon's servants came to look, and to their surprise, doors the upper room were locked. So they said, oh, yeah, you know, he's probably attending to his knees in the cool chamber. So they waited till they were embarrassed, and still he had to open the doors of the upper room. What do they think he's doing? He's using the bathroom. We're kind of embarrassed. We don't knock on the door. He's been in there a while, and I don't know if I embarrass the king. Is that going to be good? No, so they waited until it's like, this is crazy. What in the world's happened to him? So they go, they took a key and opened the door, and there was their master fallen dead on the floor. But Ehud had escaped while they delayed and passed beyond the stone images and escaped to Syrah. And it happened when he arrived that he blew the trumpet in the mountains of Ephraim. The children of Israel went down with him from the mountains, and he led them. Then he said to him, follow me, for the Lord has delivered your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. So they went down after him, seized the fords of the Jordan leading to Moab, and did not allow anyone to cross over. And at that time, they killed. So not only did they kill the king, but the, his subjects get all excited. We're going to, you know, we're going to get the assassin. So they ended up killing 10,000 men of Moab. They shut off their exit. All stout men of valor. Not a man escaped. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest for 80 years. So what's happened now? Oh man, it's great. God has prevailed. God is good. We're going to serve you for 80 years. Doesn't it kind of seem now like things are finally on track? Wait a minute. Judges doesn't end in chapter 3. So this must not be the end. And you know it isn't. Now, Shamgar... Shamgar is mentioned in this text, and he's also mentioned in the song, Deborah's song, in chapter 5 at verse 6. In that text, we find similar to what we find here, except that Shamgar is mentioned with Jael in that text. Here, here's what's interesting about that. Jael was the wife of Heber the Kenite, not an Israelite. But Shamgar is associated with, with Jael, there are a lot of people who think that Shamgar, although he is, and he'll be depicted as a deliverer, wasn't actually an Israelite at all, but someone that God used in order to deliver his people. Several reasons for that. Number one, we don't go into a lot of detail. In fact, we only have one verse right here, and the other verse just really just reflecting the connection between him and Jael, the non-Israelite. And then secondly, there's, there's an interesting thing about his name. After him was Shamgar, the son of Anath. Who is Anath? Well, you know, typically when somebody's associated with somebody like we saw with Othniel, we can retrace their genealogy and we find out exactly how they fit in all of this. Shamgar, who is the son of Anath, uh, there's no enough in the scriptures except a couple of handful of places. In those places, it is actually enough who was 
the Ashtoreth, the female god, Anath. Anath was a Canaanite god. You say, well, there was also a town called Anath. Yes, yes, actually, there was. Guess what it was? It was a Canaanite town named after whom? <laughs> the goddess Anath, the Ashereth. So there are a lot of people who think probably Shamgar, maybe not even an Israelite. But here's why he's in this story. Because he killed 600 men of the Philistines with an ox goad. And he delivered Israel. You ever hear of anybody killing a bunch of Philistines with an ox goad? His name also starts with an S. Um, Samson. Samson killed a slew of Philistines, as we will see later, with an ox goad as well. Anybody know what an ox goad is? It's a stick. <laughs> yeah, it's a poker. Uh, probably, uh, they said, I I've read the thing could be 10 feet long. You know, for stuff you don't want to touch with a 9-foot pole. There's your 10-foot pole. And it probably had like a brass pointy thing on it. So, you know, the oxen... You say, hey, giddy up there, and the oxen goes, mm. <laughs> you say, mm, giddy up. Then he giddy up, right? Okay, so this is what Shamgar uses in order to kill all of these Philistines. You say, well, why, why is this in here? Well, one thing would be, if in fact he was not an Israelite, what does this tell us similar to what we find in the genealogy of Jesus? God sometimes used... The heathens even. In order to help his people. Because God's determination is what? I'm going to see that my, starts with a W, my will is done. If there's nobody up to the task, who will God choose? Someone else. You won't do it? God will choose somebody else. That's why when the opportunity knocks on our door, we should always say what? We should always say, yes, Lord, here am I, send me. Maybe there wasn't anybody capable of taking on the Philistines or who would do it. Shamgar was willing to do it. So we, we have all this, this interesting stuff happening. And, and I get the idea, given that it's included in the song of Deborah in chapter 5 at verse 6, that Shamgar was kind of working along, to, along the same time as Ehud in the, like the southwest portion of, of the region in order to quell the attacks of the Philistines. You notice that part of the group of people that were going to ultimately afflict Israel, among them were the Philistines. Maybe it wasn't time for them to kind of raise the ire. So Shamgar comes in and what does he do? He Does he shut that thing down? He absolutely does. We don't find out that, you know what, he eventually became the mayor <laughs> or some kind, of, some kind of civic ruler. All we know is when it was time to take action, God used Shamgar to get that job done. Okay, so we have Deborah and Barak. You say, well, now, Ken, you know, in all this, all this text that we're going to see, I get it that Deborah is mentioned as judge. Makes sense. You know, Barak, he's not really ever mentioned that way. But in my mind, these two are a tandem act. Now, she has her own husband. Understand that. But in terms of their responsibility to Israel, they become a tandem act. In fact, Deborah, Deborah is the one who kind of instigates or, or offers the opportunity for us to go to war. And she's like, Barak, you know, now's your, now's your chance. You're going to do this? And he's like, I don't know. Uh, if you'll do it with me, I will. And Okay, yeah, I'll go with you. So they're tied together in that way. What's interesting to me is you only hear about Deborah in this book. You don't hear about Deborah ever again in any reference. However, we do hear about Barak again. Barak is included in David's list of all of the mighty men of valor, but more significantly, I think, is Barak's mention in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 32. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, of Jephthah. I want to stop right there. Those, at least three of those were what? They were judges. Okay, that's a list of four judges, or three judges. 
Now, this guy's right in the mix of that, right? Barak. Doesn't say, uh, and, and what Solomon more safe at the time would tell me of Gideon, of Deborah, of Samson, than Jephthah. No. Now, we know Deborah's the judge, but it mentions Barak. Why did it mention Barak and not Deborah? You say, well, you know, in the, in the list of faith, it never mentions any men. Is that true? Shake your head this way. No, it doesn't. Uh, is Sarah mentioned? Does it talk about Rahab? Not your head this way. Yeah, it does. So that's not the problem. Barak was what with Deborah? Together, right? They were a tandem act. And so what was Deborah's victory was also, <laughs> was also Barak's victory. Who shows the greater faith in the story? Boy, that is a sticky wicket right there because you say, well, you know, it was Deborah's idea and it was Deborah who encouraged her. It's Deborah's song. But Barak is the man of war. He is the reluctant man of war who says, I won't go unless the woman goes with me. Now let me ask you this, why is it that there is a female judge in this time in Israel? You say, well, that's because... The adage can maybe you permit the weak men create hard times. Okay. That's a theory of mine. Uh, one obviously would be, well, God called her. Duh. <laughs> okay, peace. But, but why? Why is it that, for instance, he called Deborah? He said, wow, she did a great job. I think I'll call women from now on. Because this was what kind of society? This was a patriarchal society. In almost everything that people engaged themselves in, who always was at the forefront? The men, almost, almost always. With the exception of those times when the men failed to do what? rise up and lead, and when the men wouldn't lead, did that then just ruin the whole business? God can't successfully accomplish His will. Boo-hoo! Well, no. God said, that's fine. Deborah will be my judge, and then I will use, I think, Barak along with her in order to accomplish my will. It, it's in that sense that, that personally, I, I see Barak also, <laughs> let's, let's make him a lowercase j judge, okay? Not the uppercase one, the, the lowercase one. Oh, it's 6 o'clock. we got to stop right here. Uh, next time, we'll, we'll quickly refresh that, but we got to move on. So what you've got to do is read, right? Next time, we're going to consider Gideon. Another big section, chapter 6, 7, and 8. To your advantage to go ahead and read it, because we're not going to read all of those sections. We'll pull out those sections that are pertinent to establishing the important points relative to Gideon as a judge. Okay? I'll tell you this way. And we may have some new technology next time. Yay! That's exciting. Let's have a prayer, and then we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you so much for your blessing of time that, that you've put on all of us, and we're thankful for... Uh, your word and just the beauty that it unfolds and just the way you hammer over and over again the importance of us being faithful to you and despite our unfaithfulness, how you manage us and you make possible our restoration. We, we see that plainly in these stories, but Lord, help us to be more cognizant of the fact that you still do that, that even when we go astray, you bring people or circumstances to light that help us to find our way back to you, and we're grateful for that. Uh, please bless us in our continued studies. We're reading this. helps to find the time necessary to read it and absorb it and to be able to learn something as we come together uh, as a group. Thank you, and bless us with the further exercise of this evening. In Jesus' name, amen.